Good afternoon. Blessed Sabbath to you all. I haven't been able to wish you that so far today, so I, I thought I would take the opportunity. It's good to see all of you. Um, right, so throat camp <laughs> questions have been popping up, popping up on this matter of the 144,000. Um, obviously, people have some views on it. They wanted to know, well, what are my views? What do I think? So um, I thought it important that we do not let the camp finish without seeking to answer the particular question, not all the questions on the 144,000, but a particular question which we will endeavor to um, address this afternoon. So we're looking at then a, a discussion on the 144,000. What I will do, I have prepared some um, questions on PowerPoint. They are also being placed on a handout along with a couple of quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy, so you will have the material in your hands, and uh, you will therefore be able to better address the matter. So, um, oh, I, all right, so we are going to pray and we are going to begin when the handouts are ready or the handout is ready, I believe we will get it. Everybody ready? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the blessings of the camp so far, the blessings of this day so far. As we now come to our last session, we pray for renewed grace, renewed strength, renewed vigor the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Give us a, a desire to learn a, a spirit of attention and a, a thirst for knowledge and understanding and above all the thirst for Jesus our Savior. We thank you for the, the messages you sent to edify and uplift your people. And as we now study this matter relating to the 144,000, we pray for your presence and the guidance of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A question? A question? Questions to... On the Holy Spirit, from Brother Patrick. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, I would like to ask a question. Eh? From me or Brother Patrick? Well, you're, you're an elder too, so the question can just ask for any, any elder can answer that question. Who? The question was asked, gift. So we're in the church. The Holy Spirit is supposed to guide us to our gift. When the Holy Spirit guides members or believers to their gift, who direct this gift after in the church? Or who lead these gifts in the church? Or where to see where these gifts go? Or they die in the bench? Or they die in the churchyard? Where these gifts go? That's my first one. Um, Brother Patrick, you wrong? Any endless person can answer that honestly. You don't have to be with a, a, a black man to come on to answer. Any elder can answer that equally. 
Um, so, all right, ask the question again. Ask it again. When the Holy Spirit direct gifts to we the members or we the believers who direct this gift. Because in the church you have the elders supposedly supposed to have deacon also. Well, I don't see that part. So we have elders who guide this gift or this gift die in the bench or they die in the churchyard. All right. Um, well, <clears throat> no, the first thing is that I don't think we, we are going to spend a lot of time on these questions because we, we can't pre I can't prepare to deal with um, the 144,000. So I'm not going to spend much time on, the, on the, the questions of the Holy Spirit. So who directs the gifts in the church? Well, the, <clears throat> the leadership in the church is supposed to encourage the members to seek and develop the gifts of the Spirit. And secondly, the, the leadership should recognize the gifts of the Spirit in the members and encourage the development and use of those gifts. Elder Douglin, I'm, I'm going to pose this one to you, Elder Douglin. Uh, this is just a, a history correction also. When this, this slave when they get their freedom, a lot of them, if they did leave the paradise, they would have dead for hungry. They have nothing to eat off of. So they have to remain into that slave. And in the latter end, them themselves turn around and buy out back. A lot of them buy out back the slave land to their own self because they work the same slave land that they couldn't get out to make freedom for themselves because they were in a bondage. So they have to stay there because if they go out, they were dead for hungry. So some of them had to stay a while in order to uh, catch themselves. Okay, um, thank you, Brother Price. Um, 144,000. risk? All right. Well, what I'm going to do is deal with the 144,000 and uh, try, if possible, to, to get some time in for the, for the other aspects of the discussion. Now, I Okay, well, let me... We, we, we can discuss any topic we want. So let me say a couple of things. I specifically asked this morning for this session to deal with the 144,000. I'm quite willing to try as far as possible to finish in time to be able to address other topics. What I'm not going to do is to have other topics intermingling with the discussion on the 144,000. So I'm going to begin. Discussion on the 144,000. Um, We have, okay, handouts are coming as well. We are looking here at what is introduced in Revelation 7. And in Revelation 7, essentially, we have introduced 
144,000 servants of God from all the tribes of the children of Israel sealed with the seal of the living God, 12,000 from each mentioned tribe. I said each mentioned tribe because when you examine the tribes of Israel as we see them coming forth in Genesis, the, the children of Jacob, we see a particular 12 tribes. When we read um, Revelation 7, we see a slightly different um, numeration of the tribes in that, for instance, the tribe of Dan is not mentioned in Revelation 7. So I, um, that's, why I may, that's why I use the term 12,000 from each mentioned tribe. And we also see in Revelation 7 a great multitude which no man could number. So in Revelation 7, we have introduced 144,000 servants of God from all the tribes of the children of Israel, sealed with the seal of the living God, 12,000 from each mentioned tribe, a great multitude which no man, and a great multitude which no man could number. The question then, the question that has been coming to me for the whole camp is this. This is the question that I've been getting. Will the 144,000 preach the loud cry message and bring in the great multitude? In, in Revelation 7, we have 144,000 mentioned, and we also have a great multitude mentioned. So the question that I've been getting all camp essentially is this. Will the, great, will the 144,000 preach the loud cry message and bring in the great multitude. Um, and people have been telling me that that is what they see in the Bible. People have been telling me that they see in the Bible, listen carefully, people have been telling me that they see in the Bible that the 144,000 will preach the loud cry message and bring in the, hundred, bring in the great multitude. Is that correct? Let's read Revelation 7 to begin then. Revelation 7, we're just reading it through and um, what I want you to do as we read is tell me if you see in here, if you see in this passage, that the 144,000 will preach the loud cry and bring in the great multitude. You understand what I want you to do? As we read the passage, tell me if you see in the passage that the 144,000 will preach the loud cry and bring in the great multitude. So we're going to read. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, neither the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So that is the servants of God receiving the seal of the living God in their foreheads. And the angel said, do not let the winds blow on the earth until we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads with the seal of the living God. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. 
of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. So that's the 144,000, and we see 12,000 from each of the mentioned tribe that were sealed. The question I am still asking you to, to tell me is, as we read this passage, do we see where it says the 144,000 will preach and bring in the Lord Christ? Has anything been mentioned so far about 144,000 preaching? No. So now the great multitude. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the Lamb. So this, this is a great multitude that no man could number. Pardon? No, all I said is this is the great multitude which no man could number. Well, they stood before the throne, yeah. And before the, sorry, and before the lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? So the question is being asked about the great multitude. Who are they, and where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So the 144,000 were introduced, and the great multitude was introduced. Did we read that the 144,000 would preach? Did we read that the 144,000 would preach and bring in the great multitude? Yes or no? No or yes? No. All right. But I'm hearing people saying that the 144,000 would preach and bring in the great multitude. All I'm seeing there in chapter 7 is that 144,000 was presented and a great multitude was presented. No apparent connection was made between the two. Nothing was said that one brought in the other. Nothing was said that one influenced the other. All that was done is one was first introduced, then the other was introduced. I don't know if there is other evidence where it is shown in the Bible that the 144,000 preach and bring in the great multitude, but certainly not in Revelation chapter 7. And I am one who say that we, we, we get the evidence from the scripture here a little and there a little, line upon line and precept upon precept. So first of all, I'm saying I do not see anything in Revelation 7 which introduces the 144,000 and the great multitude showing that the 144,000 preaches and bring in the great multitude. But I'm open to scriptural evidence from other passages which would show that to be the truth if such evidence is available. So this evening you have the opportunity to present the evidence for um, if you hold that belief that the 144,000 preaches the, the, the law crime and brings in the great multitude, you will have opportunity this afternoon to present the evidence. But certainly we find none in Revelation 7. Okay. Mike.
Good afternoon. The argument that is used is Revelation 7 is that the 144,000 are called servants of the living God. That means they have a work to do. Yeah. And therefore they conclude and assume that that work is preaching the loud cry and bringing in the great multitude. Okay. Not understanding the work of the 144,000 even after the closure of probation. Okay. All right. Sister Leslie. Um, at least stand up so that the, the watchers can see you. Hi, good evening. Um, just a question um, on clarity. Do we accept that the, or do you accept that the 144,000 will, are the ones who will go through the Great Tribulation? Um, what is the Great Tribulation? What do you understand by the Great Tribulation? That time of trouble such as never was. And what is that? The time of Jacob's trouble. Um, the mark of the, the beast crisis. The end time events that will um, signal the end. I mean, if it's different, just tell me because I'm, I'm seeing... Okay, all right. Well, um, in, in Adventist terminology and in Spirit of Prophecy terminology... There is something called the early time of trouble, which begins with the launching of the mark of the beast crisis with the passing of Sunday laws. Are you listening to me carefully? Yes, sir. In Adventism, we talk about the early time of trouble, which lasts from the passing of Sunday laws to the close of probation. We talk about the great time of trouble that begins at the close of probation with the um, with the with the troubles, including the seven last plagues. The great time of trouble starts at the close of probation and runs right through the seven last plagues down to the second coming of Christ. So there's the early time of trouble, which begins at the passing of the Sunday laws and run to the close of probation. Then there's the great time of trouble that starts at the close of probation and includes the seven last plagues and goes down to the second coming of Christ. Then there's something called the time of Jacob's trouble that is not the early time of trouble. It is not the great time of trouble, nor is it the two combined. The time of Jacob's trouble is a short period of time when the saints who have been sentenced to death, cry out to God for deliverance. That begins between the second and the third plague and finishes at the fifth plague. Are we, are, um, we clear on those? So the, there's a, the, the time of Jacob's trouble is not the same as the, as the great time of trouble or the early time of trouble or the whole time of trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is just a small period of time between the second from the, from the third to the the fifth plague, when the saints of God cry out for deliverance. There's an early time of trouble that begins with the passing of the Sunday law and ends at the close of probation. Then there's a great time of trouble that starts at the close of probation and ends with the second coming of Christ. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... So your question now is... Just let me be more um, exact. Revelation 7.14 says... 7.14. Um, these are the... Referring to the great multitude, these are they which came out of great tribulation. So then, could you then tell me which of the events you describe, um, if any of them, would represent the great tribulation? And if the 144,000 also go through that great tribulation as described in 14. Okay. All right. Well, we are going to come to... Well, I'm not sure if all those questions, but we are going to come to some things that will help to answer those questions. Um, by the way, I have asked the questions that I want you all to answer. Anyhow, um, we'll see where that gets. Just give me a moment here. Good. 
So, so the first question that I've asked is, do we see anywhere in Revelation 7 where it says that the, the 144,000 preach the loud cry or do any preaching and bring in the great multitude? I don't see it. Nobody has seen it as yet. Examining the evidence. So I'm, I'm just going through the questions so that you, you will be able to um, come up with some answers um, as we go along. In Revelation 7, we see that the angels hold back the wings of strife from blowing on the earth until the 144,000 are sealed in their foreheads. This is Revelation 7, 1 to 3. Question. These are the questions then that will help us to understand the issues. Good. Question. There, remember that they are, we, are, we are told that they receive the seal of the living God in their foreheads and that the winds of strife are not to blow until they receive this seal in their foreheads. Question. What is the seal of the living God? What are the criteria for receiving the seal? When is this seal affixed or fixed? Before or after the Lord Cry message? Do we get the seal before the Lord Cry message or do we get the seal after the Lord Cry message? The winds of strife. What are the winds of strife mentioned in Revelation 7? When do these winds blow? When do the winds of strife blow? At the start of the mark of the beast crisis or after the close of probation, after the loud cry message? When do the winds blow? What are the winds and when do they blow? At the start of the mark of the beast crisis or after the close of probation, after the end of the loud cry message? In Revelation 14, the 144,000 are described as first fruits. What is the role of first fruits? Do first fruits signal the readiness of the harvest, or do first fruits reap the rest of the harvest? And those questions are on your hand, by the way. We come to something called the grain ripening process. Under the early rain, the plant springs up and produces fruit. First the blade, then the ear. We know about corn in Barbados. You get the, the plant springing up and then you see this ear of corn coming up. Under the latter rain, the grain fills out and then the grain is brought to harvest ready, golden, maturity and hardness under the burning heat of the sun. In terms of the final events, what is the heat that we must endure in order to be ready for the harvest? When do we receive the seal of the living God? Before going through the heat or as a result of going through the heat? In Revelation 15, 2 and 3, a group of victorious persons is mentioned in Revelation 15, 2 and 3. Let's read Revelation 15, 2 and 3. Revelation 15, verses 2 and 3. We are looking in the Bible there for it. Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, and stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So this, this group has gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark. Question asks is, are these, is this group, the 144,000, yes or no? If yes, what are the implications of the fact that they
technology. What are the implications of the fact that they gained the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark? Okay, I'm finishing my brief little section soon. Two quotations now, and, and I'm finished. From Great Controversy, page 604, 605, fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought. The powers of earth uniting to war against the commandments of God will decree that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and born, shall conform to the customs of the church by observing the false Sabbath. So this is the mark of the beast crisis, when the laws are passed. All who refuse complaints will be visited with civil penalties and it will finally be declared that they are deserving of death. On the other hand, the law of God in joining the Creator's rest day demands obedience and threatens wrath against all who transgress its precepts. With the issue thus clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. So people receive the mark of the beast after the Sunday, the Sunday laws are passed, setting up the mark of the beast. Good. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. The warning from heaven is, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. But no one is made to suffer the wrath of God until until the truth has been brought home to his mind. What, by the way, what is this wrath of God that is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation? What is this wrath of God that those who receive the mark of the beast will get? The, the seven last plagues. And the seven last plagues are poured out after the close of probation. But no one is made to suffer the wrath of God until the truth has been brought home to his mind and conscience and has been rejected. There are many who have never had an opportunity to hear the special truths for this time. The obligation of the fourth commandment has never been set before them in its true light. He who reads every heart and tries every motive will leave none who desire a knowledge of the truth to be deceived as to the issues of the controversy. The decree is not to be urged upon the people blindly. Everyone is to have sufficient light to make up his, make his decision intelligently. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. This is true during the mark of the beast crisis. When the Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, people will be tested during the mark of the beast crisis, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test, the Sabbath test, during the mark of the beast crisis, the test is after the Sunday laws have been passed. So when the Sunday laws have been passed and the test has been brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. That line of distinction then will be between those who now receive the seal of God and those who have the mark of the beast. Only after the test of the Sabbath has been brought during the mark of the beast crisis. Will the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God. The keeping of the Sabbath in obedience to the law, to God's law, is an evidence of loyalty to the creator. This test, as I said, is only brought when the mark of the beast is set up. Why one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive this mark of the beast, the other, choosing in the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. So when is the seal of God received? We said in Revelation 7 that the 144,000 receive the seal of God. So from this passage, when do they receive that seal? According to this passage, you, we, we get the seal of God when after the Sunday law has been passed, after the message of warning has been given, and uh, when, through the test, 
we choose allegiance to God. So, we, so from this passage, I'm seeing that we receive the seal of God after the Lokroi pro proclamation, after we have an and after we have passed the test of the mark of the beast. That's when we receive the seal of God, not before the mark of the beast, not before the Lord cry. So we don't receive the seal to preach the mark of the beast or to go through the Lord cry. We receive the seal after the preaching of the mark of the beast, after the preaching of the Lord cry, and after going through and enjoying the mark of the beast. That's when we get the seal of the living God in the foreheads. Therefore, the 144,000, as I am seeing it, are produced not before the Lord cry, not before the mark of the beast crisis, but after the mark of the beast crisis, after the preaching of the Lord cry. So that's one quotation. And another quotation here from Great Controversy. Great, great Controversy, 613, 614. This is um, the start of the time of trouble. Great time of trouble, sorry. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since, since there was a nation even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that, is, that shall be found written in the book. This now is a time of trouble when Michael stands up. When is this time? It is being introduced now. The time of trouble when Michael stands up is now going to be introduced. A time period is affixed to it. Some events are affixed to it. When the third angel's message closes, Mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. When the third angel message closes, that is at the end of the preaching of the Lord Cry message. That is when the third angel message, angel's message closes. Mercy no longer pleads for the inhabitants of the earth. In other words, probation is closed. Christ's work in the sanctuary is accomplished. He's no longer in interceding for anybody. The third angel's message has closed. Probation has closed. Christ finishes his work in the sanctuary. He is no longer interceding. The people of God have accomplished their work. Preached the Lord cry, warned every man, and everybody has made his or her decision. They have received the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and they are now prepared for the trying hour before them. Remember, at this point in time, probation has closed. So the trying hour before them has nothing to do with preaching, but something else. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. This is after the Lord Christ message is finished, after the close of probation. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world, and all who have proven themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. So when do God's servants receive the seal of the living God? After probation has closed, after they have finished their work of preaching the Lord cry, when every mind has been made up. That is when they receive the seal of the living God. Then Jesus ceases his, his intercession in the sanctuary above. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice says, it is done. And all the angelic hosts lay off their crowns as he makes the solemn announcement, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Probation has closed. Everybody has made up their minds. Some have received the mark of the beast. Some have, others have received the seal of the living God. Christ finishes his work in the sanctuary and he says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Every case has been decided for life or death. Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. Is any preaching going, going to be done now? No. Probation closed. 
the number of his subjects is made up. So Christ, the, the people who are going to be in Christ's kingdom is complete. Nobody else is going to be saved or lost. Everybody that has to be lost has been lost. Everybody that has to be saved has been saved. The kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is about to be given to the ears of salvation. And Jesus is to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. When he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. So at this time, then, they are not preaching. They are living in the sight of, a God, of God without an intercessor. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed. So this is the veins of strife now being let go. After they have received the seal. And Satan has entire control of the finally, finally impenitent. God's long suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy and despised his love and trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The spirit of God persistently resisted has been la at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by divine grace, they have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. This is the trouble now that is mentioned in Revelation 17 after the, the servants of God have received receive their seal. This is not the trouble that begins when the mark of the beast is set up. This is the trouble that begins now at the close of probation. The, the mark of the beast was set up. The message was preached. Everybody made up their mind. Probation closed. Some received the mark of the beast. Some received the seal of God. Now that time of trouble, that great time of trouble begins. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion. These are the angels of Revelation 7 letting go. Now that the servants of God have been sealed in their foreheads, these angels cease to hold and check the fierce winds of human passion. All the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in a ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. So what I'm seeing is this, that the mark of the beast crisis is set up. The, the mark of the beast is set up through the passing of laws. The, the people of God proclaim the loud cry message. During this time, people either receive the, um, conform to the system or show allegiance to God. When that period is finished and everybody has their mind, the preaching is finished, people have made their decisions. The seal of God then is affixed to those who have been victorious, um, who have been loyal to God. The, um, the mark of the beast then is received by those who have chosen that line, Christ ceases his work in the heavenly sanctuary, probation is closed, and then that time of trouble begins when the angels of Revelation 7 let loose the veins of strife. So what I'm seeing there is that the 144,000 are formed at the close of probation, therefore they do not, and they, and they receive their seal at the close of probation when every, every mind is made up, Therefore, I am not seeing that the 144,000 preach the love cry to bring in anybody, but the initial love cry servants preach the message, bring in those who come in, and all of them, those who began to preach, and those who received their message at the close of probation, they receive the seal of the living God and form the 144,000, which then go through the great time of trouble, and within that great time of trouble, they go through the time of Jacob's trouble. No for your questions. The last part, starting again. When the mark of the beast is set up, Sunday laws are passed, the final crisis begins. The servants of God who are preparing all they know receive the final outpouring of the latter rain and proclaim the loud cry message. They are also resisting the pressure to join the mark of the beast. As they proclaim their message, others join and also turn and proclaim the message. So we have a people proclaiming, others joining and proclaiming, others joining and proclaiming till everybody receives the message and makes up their mind. At the end then of the proclamation of the message, those who have been proclaiming the message and remain faithful to God and have endured the heat of the mark of the beast crisis, they receive the seal of the living God. The others receive the mark of the beast. So at the, and this is now at the close of probation. After the message has been preached, 
after people have, have gone through the crisis, the mark of the beast crisis, and have either given their allegiance to God or have received the mark of the beast. At the end of that time, the people of God received the seal of God and the others received the mark of the beast. At that time then, probation is closed. Nobody else is to be saved. Nobody else, no preaching is needed. So the people of God received the seal of the living God in their foreheads at a time when no more preaching is to be done. Their work now is to go through the time of trouble and continue to reveal God's character. No more preaching, no more souls to be saved. The great time of trouble begins, and within that time of trouble, then we will see the time of Jacob's trouble. But the servants of God do not receive the seal of the living God in order to preach the loud cry message. They receive it after the preaching of the loud cry message when, every, when they and others like them have endured the crisis, passed the test, and now receive the seal of the living God in their foreheads. When that is done, the great time of trouble begins. They do not, do, they do not now preach because there are no more souls to be saved. They are representing God in a different way. Questions? You're coming around. Um, well, three things. One, uh, I think that Hammers at me. Okay. Um, number one, you mentioned that the seal of God is affixed after the preaching of the loud cry. A fixed, and the latter end is affixed or fixed. Whichever, whichever one is more. And by fixing, I mean it is, it is fixed now in place. Oh, it it's has closed. Been, huh? Everybody sealed then. Yes. The, 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 the finishing of the sealing oh, the takes finishing place of the then. Sealing. The okay, finishing great, of great. the sealing. The, and when I say the finishing of the sealing, the finishing of the sealing of everyone who receives the sealing. Right, to be sealed. Right. So there's a beginning point of the sealing and well, there's all, an ending point. All like now we, are, we, are, we could be in the process of receiving that being sealed. But the finishing process for everyone who receives it is at the close of probation. Um, what does the latter rain do? The latter rain, the latter rain prepares. Let's go back. Here we have this part of the presentation. Under the early rain, the plant springs up and produces fruit. First the blade, then the ear. Under the latter rain, the grain fills out. The grain is brought to harvest ready, golden maturity and hardness under the burning heat. So the latter rain enables us to proclaim the loud cry message during the mark of the beast. And the latter rain also enables us to go through the hardening process under the sun, the heat of the mark of the beast. So we receive the latter rain, we preach the message, but during the mark of the beast, as we endure the crisis, we are brought to harvest ready, golden maturity and hardness through the heat of the mark of the so beast. So who begins to preach the loud cry? The people that begin to preach the loud cry are we who are here now, if we follow on to know the Lord and receive right. the latter rain. So we have to receive the latter rain first. Yes. Good. So there's the initial outcry servant that have to receive the latter rain first. Yes. And then others receive the latter rain. Join, as they preach, others join them. Pre other, the and then by the time probation closes, everybody has to receive, uh, that, uh, that should receive the latter rain, will receive the latter rain and be I would have proclaimed the loud cry. Yes. Okay. The second point is, what exactly give, is the latter end? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. What exactly seals the people of God? 
The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit whereby ye are sealed. So the Holy Spirit is the sealing agent. Am I right? Grieve not the Holy Spirit whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit does the sealing. No. But what, what phase of the Holy Spirit does the sealing? The early rain or the latter rain? Um, <clears throat> no. Let me explain something that I went through a couple of weeks back before camp. I said that, and, and there's something that people put in the, in the face of Adventists because we say that the seal of the living God has to do with the Sabbath. The rat stuff and others say, well, the seal of God is the Holy Spirit. So let me, let me make clear what I'm talking about. There's a seal of God which is the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest, which is given to every believer. That's the seal of the Spirit. When we come to Revelation 7, and we talk about the seal of the living God, that is something different, altogether different. It, it, no. We're talking about early rain seal, a seal under the early rain, but we're talking about the latter rain sealing. Good. Well, even the latter rain is the Holy Spirit seal. The latter rain is the Holy Spirit seal. The seal of the living God in the forehead, yes, it is done by the Spirit. But the seal of the living God in the forehead is in Revelation 14 talking about, mentioned as having his name in her forehead. So it, you're is, saying also, it is also called a settling into the truth so that we cannot be made to, be, to move. It is, also called, it is also the seal of the Sabbath, which is different now from the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does the sealing, but the seal of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit given to every believer. The seal of the living God is, is the name of God. It is the Sabbath of God, and it is that seal that we receive, having received the latter rain seal, and then passed the test of the final crisis. Uh, well, if what you're saying is what you're saying, I will really disagree with that one, but I'll, I'll mention this point. When the Holy Spirit is poured out in Lateran measure, what other outpouring of the Holy Spirit is necessary to seal God's people with the final apocalyptic seal? <laughs> the Lateran, as I said here, the Lateran ripens the grain and allows it to go through the heat Right. of the final crisis that will bring it now to harvest ready, golden, hard maturity. When that is done, that is the time that I see the people of God receiving the seal of the living God in right. their foreheads. You see, the problem there is when we have the people of God receiving the seal, not understanding that there's a progressive seal in work. And I have already said that, that has a beginning. I said, I said the, that it is beginning. The final crisis, now. the final group, the 144,000 being sealed, has a beginning point with the initial outcry servant and an ending point to the last man who receives the latter end. So the, right. I don't know of any other. Oh, I don't know of any other outpouring of the spirit that will do the apocalyptic sealing. I only know of the latter end. Because right. the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is to seal us unto the day of redemption. Okay. There's no other sealing agent other than the Holy Spirit. So the purpose of the outpouring of the Spirit is to seal God's people, with, and that's the final apocalyptic seal with the latter end outpouring of the Spirit. All right. All right. We can always discuss that. All right. Brother, all right, brother Saul, just hold on a second. Me and you should be having this, this particular discussion here. Because the big point that I'm trying to get through, especially for our overseas campers, the big point I'm trying to get through is this. Do the 144,000 preach the loud cry or, or, and bring I, I was getting off of, I was getting off of that point. You and point. I can argue about that other thing. Or later. I was getting off of that point. Good. But you, 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 you just reiterated another point. The next point I want to ask, the question and comment is, there's only one ceiling, a final ceiling. And all that is to receive that final apocalyptic seal must receive it by the time probation closes. 
there's no other group that will be sealed. So when probation closes, only one group is going through, and that is the sealed group. The Not the 144,000, and then the great multitude. Oh, okay. You understand what I'm saying? One group. One group. Yeah. Going right through. So one is not going to have the seal of the living God, and the other one, the great multitude, coming in. Yeah. So that's false. All that receive the seal of the living God, by the time probation closes, will make up the 144,000. Good. And those are the ones who will be living sin at the second coming of Christ. Yeah. So you're saying then that there's no truth to the idea there that the, groups. the only two groups are the living sin and the risen sin. Right. So you're not entertaining the idea then, you're not agreeing with the idea that the 144,000 receive the seal of the living God and then go and preach and bring in the, the great No, multitude. there's only one seal group. Right. But what I will say is that the initial loud Christ servant, when they go out to preach the loud cry, they will bring in great multitudes. Yes. But not the great multitude of Revelation 7, 9. Y'all follow me there, right? No, he says that no. when, the, when the initial, he's not talking about the, the 144,000. When the initial loud cry servant begin to preach the loud cry, yeah. multitudes will respond. Yes. But the, those multitudes that will respond is not the great multitude of Revelation 7, 9. Right. That's all I'm saying. Good. So, so, so uh, hold, hold a minute. Hold the a great minute. multi. The multitudes that will come in during the preaching of the loud cry are those that are in Babylon. Yeah. And they, they that... Notice, that don't, get, don't miss the point. The initial loud cry servant are those who start the ball rolling. When they preach, the spread of prophecy says, thousands will take their stand on the side of God's people. That, those are multitudes. Yeah. And the spread of prophecy mentions that there are multitudes that will take their side on God's people. Right. Uh, but that does not constitute the great multitude. Of Those multitudes that will come in will join the initial outcry servant to make up the 144,000. Good. So you hear what Brother Saul is saying? I, I'm confusing people? No. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me explain what Brother Saul is saying. He's speaking truth. The initial outcry servants will begin to proclaim the outcry message. Their message will bring in great multitudes. These great multitudes will join and proclaim the message and bring in others. And at the end of the message, the initial Lord Christ servants, along with the multitudes that came in, will form the 144,000. That is different from saying that the 144,000 will preach the Lord Christ and bring in the great multitude. What Brother Saul is saying is that the initial Lord Christ servants will preach, bring in multitudes, the multitudes will turn around and preach and bring in others. And at the end of the message, the initial servants, along with these great multitudes, will then form the 144,000 who don't go anywhere and preach because everybody has been saved when the 144,000 is sealed. So Brother Saul has spoken truth. Next question. Jesus on the cross said to the thief that, he would be with him today in paradise. Is this paradise a place, a part of, of the heavenly realm? And in the second coming, the dead, of, the dead in Christ will rise first. Uh, where, where will they go? Will they be watching what is happening in, in the low cry? Will, will they be already risen from the grave? The message that we preach is that when any person dies, he goes into the grave. Uh -huh. He can't see, he can't hear, can't eat, drink, sleep, do anything. So the saints don't die and go to heaven to watch anything happen. Right. There are a few people that have been resurrected or um, like Moses and, and, and there are a few people who have been translated like Enoch and Elijah, but the, the, the multitudes of the saints have gone to their graves they await the resurrection. They only come up in the resurrection after the preaching of the Lord cry, after the close of probation, after the seven last plagues at the second coming of Christ. So they don't see any of the final events. That, they are that, in their graves. 
that, that is the answer to my question. Good, thank you. Okay. Sister Margaret. Two, two questions. So the initial loud cry servant and then the multitude that they bring in, they are those, they be preaching. Yeah. And they are those who will make up the 144,000. Yeah, the ones, somebody told me the ones that, um, they said a few of them might die, but essentially, yes. So really and truly the 144,000 did preach. The 144,000 did, did preach. preach did preach uh -huh. before they became before. the 144,000, not after. They okay. don't preach after they become the 144,000. They become the 144,000 after preaching and after having passed the test of the final crisis. All right, second question. I'm hearing about this great multitude that were coming from Babylon. And that were coming from Babylon? Yes. Where, where do you see that? I, I heard it. You heard it? Yes, yeah, oh. but the saw just mentioned that. But right? you don't see it in the Bible. Um, so, is this 144,000 um, more than 144,000? Is it a literal number or is it not like, symbolic? And with that in mind, if you can then explain, depending on how you answer it, of course, explain what Sister White says. I, I only, I don't know, I, it might not be in context. So I'm just reading a sentence. From Word to the Little Flock, chapter 2, where she says, the living saints, 144,000 in number, which seem to suggest that it is a fixed number as opposed to symbolic. So if you can answer those two questions, please. Um, all right, all right. Okay, before I go there, any other questions on the issue? Any other questions on the issue of the 144,000 preaching and bringing in the great multitude? Any other questions on that issue? You have a question on that issue? All right, Just hold on. I'm coming to you, brother man. Good afternoon, church. Now, uh, Elder Newton, does the hundred and, no. When the Law Christ servants preach the message of, the last message of mercy to the world, what about those people that would not be on earth? Because the Bible says that it's supposed, that the whole multitude is supposed to be on earth, but then there are people on the space station right now. People on where? The space station, the International Space Station in space, as well as the people going to Mars, because that project is actually up and running. Um, yeah. I don't know when they're going to get to Mars, if they do get there. Yeah, because Jesus might come out, right? right. Um, but, but, before then. and people on the space station, look, everybody is going to hear the message. If they're on the space station, they can communicate with us in a few seconds. True, true. All right. Okay. Right. Um, so, so my question, so, so my follow-up question to that would be, when the Lord Christ servants preach the message, how they become the 144,000 when they pass, when they pass that final test, of the end time crisis. When is it that seal, that seal would be, that seal that they have would be the end of Lateran and, and is there any, because they're, cause they're gonna still be ripened and they're still gonna have more sin, not, not sin, more, I don't know how to put this, more, more, things, more, more issues, more, more, well, yeah, challenges, more challenges to be resolved because they're still going to have to endure the hunger and the, and delay to tarry for Christ. Now, I'm wondering what, is there any extension of the spirit then or, or there isn't, it's just early rain, 
sealed, laterine, seal of the living God, and then when, we go th when they go through the time of Jacob's trouble, when, when you get to plague number five, which is the sun turning into um, darkness upon the earth. Uh, All right. Um, Sister White says that they have received the latter rain, the refreshing from the Lord, and they are ready for the, the, um, the final, the great time of trouble. So the, the, the Holy Spirit takes us through the preaching of the latter rain, through the early part of the crisis, and also takes us into the, the final segment of the crisis, the great time of trouble. Thank you. Brother um, Zaki Abdullah. Praise the Lord. Or is it Abdullah? Well, that could work. Praise the Lord. You know, I thank God for the message that was received. And, and um, after hearing this message, I'm no longer a Trinidadian, <laughs> neither am I a Bajan. But I'm officially a Berean, uh, and I'm about to study these things to see if they are so. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, Ellen Newton, in your deliberation, I've, I followed you, and a lot of what you said came out clearly. But in my mind, there were a few critical things that were left out. Yeah. Namely, Revelation 7 verse 4 which says, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So the 144,000 was isolated only to the tribe of Israel. And my initial thought is where are the Gentiles that will be grafted in? That's the first point. Okay. So, we all know that those who are inheriting the kingdom of heaven would be a combination of Israel and those that are grafted in. Yeah. And if God is identifying a particular group of people for a particular purpose, they will only come in from the tribe of Israel. And as we know, those who would be saved will not only be from the tribe of Israel, but would be grafted in and become spiritual Israel. Yeah. That's the first point. So the point. next point that was, which is related, that was overlooked, because the Bible says here a little, there a little. The next point that was overlooked, in my view, was Revelation 14, verse 4, which says, These are they which will not defile with women. Now, the 144,000 not only coming from Israel, but they were not defiled by women. For the, these are virgins. So these two major points were overlooked in our deliberation. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which followed along with whoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Thank you. All right, now, um, and, and, and I just want to remind our, our Bajan brethren then that these are the reasons why I wanted to deal with the 144,000 even if we have brethren from, coming in from overseas who have, who have these issues. Um, that's not to say that we, we don't recognize the other issues like the risks and so on, and we have a little more time tomorrow, but I, I, I felt that before they went back, we, we needed to address the 144,000. Um, from the tribes of Israel, now, I laid the foundation for this during my presentations on Armageddon, when I said that not only is Israel now no longer the people of God because they can no longer preach a message of salvation through Jesus Christ because they have rejected Jesus Christ. Therefore, they, they cannot be God's representative people to preach that message of salvation. And secondly, now, the terms and language of Israel in the New Testament we see being referred to the church. Um, 
prophecy about Israel, like in Acts 15, where Amos 9, about the rebuilding of the tabernacle now, is being referred to the building up of the church, including the bringing in of the Gentiles. The language of Israel is now being referred to the church. He is no longer a true Israelite who is a blood descendant, but he who exercises faith in Jesus Christ. And um, the other one, oh, James now. If you read James chapter 1, verse 1, James addresses the church as the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Therefore, the language of Israel, even the 12 tribes language of Israel, now refers to the church. So when we read about the, 12, about the tribes in Revelation 7, we can no longer think national Israel, we think James, who says that the 12 tribes now represent the church. So that's your first question. So when I see um, 144,000 from all the tri tribes of the children of Israel, I have no problems now with national Israel. They are not the issue. The 12 tribes are now us, Jews and Gentiles who make up the church. Not defiled by women in um, Revelation 14. Now, who qualifies to be among the 144,000? Only Seventh-day Adventists, people of the third angel's message who grow up pure, never had sex, never sinned, were like Daniel to the extent that they lived righteous lives all along, um, didn't have sex outside of marriage, lived pure and holy lives. Or can you and I, are those, are those in other words, will the 144,000 be made up of only people who lived pure lives from childhood, never sinned, or can you and I, like me, who came from the world, who came in from the world, did all those things, all the wrong things, but then put my life right with Christ, can I be a hundred, among the 144,000? Yes or no? Colin just got baptized there the other day. Um, I don't know his past, but I'm assuming he had a past. He I has... Hello, Newton, if I could interject. Um, I, 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 I know, I don't believe anybody takes this as literal woman. Yeah. Because the Bible, you know, we understand that a woman represents a church. Yeah. So, oh. so it's not literal virgin. Not literal, not okay. But women as in church. But people who were in other churches. I was in another church. So the question is, can I be among the 144,000? I came out of Anglicanism. Um, I used to be a server at the altar, giving the wine to the priest, put on the, the robe, walk about with thing in my hand. Can I be among the 144,000? Or is, will the 144,000 be limited to people who came up in the pure Adventist faith, faith never went out, but remained faithful all the time? Your brother saw? Me and you? Yeah. The servant of the Lord has said, let us strive with all the power that God has given to us to be among the 144,000. It is useless striving with all the power that we have to be among the 144,000. If it is that we have to be virgins, well, he said that the virgins is not about sexual virgins. Right. So she said who, it is those who, who profess a pure faith. I had one man who told me he can't be a money hunter for a thousand because he's not a virgin. But we, it is clear from scripture that it mentions they were not defiled with women. It is not talking about literal women. Even though uh, being pure is important. But it is talking about the women of Revelation 17. The, woman, the mother harlot and the daughter harlots. They, did not, they were not corrupted with the false doctrines of Babylon. Those are the women that they were not defiled with. 
So it is not about sexuality and virginity and so on. Right. It is about False having churches. pure, true, not being defiled, not being drunken with the wines of Babylon, not being contaminated. Hence, they profess a pure faith. Yeah. That is what he's talking about. Yeah. And the first part of the question dealing with the tribes. Yeah. Israel has always been numbered at different points in time. Yeah. And there are different compositions of Israel. Yeah. So some tribes have been left out. Some have been included. But in the final Revelation 7 tribes, all the tribes of the children of Israel are mentioned. Some and not others. Yeah. You follow me there, Zach? Some are mentioned, others are not. Dan is left out. Ephraim is left out. And Manasseh and Joseph are put in. But the tribes also, according to Israel's way of reckoning, the elders, the ones who are older, are mentioned first and come down the line. In this particular list of tribes, Reuben is not the head of the list. At the head of the list, it is Judah. Yeah. And it is true to Judah that the Messiah came. Yeah. So the bloodline has changed. So it is not a literal from Abraham to Jesus Christ. So it's not the literal bloodline Jews that are being mentioned here, but those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3 says that. Yeah. So the true descendants of Jesus Christ, true Israelites indeed, are those who are of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. That is what is being talked about right there. Okay. Um, so the, the whole question of um, Israel and so on, I think we, we, we get in that clearly. The other point, just let me mention quickly, is that it. The, um, what, what Zach is getting at is whether people like me, who, ha who previously embraced false doctrine and attended other churches, whether we can be among the 144,000. So it, it doesn't require someone who had pure doctrine from the beginning, but someone who has embraced pure doctrine and made his life pure through the pure doctrine. We can become part of the 144,000. You don't have to come up in Adventism, stay in Adventism, embrace pure doctrine of Adventism and go right through. You can do that, but you can also come in from outside, come in from false doctrine, embrace the pure doctrine, and uh, make your life pure and become a member of the 144,000. Sister Flo. I just wanted to finish off the point um, Elder Saul was making by reading Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized unto Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that gives me hope of being among those tribes. Yeah, but Sister Flo, you come up in Adventism. Born Adventist. And, and, and. Yeah, uh, Brother Austin? Yeah. Um, so any other questions or comments? Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> um, I know Brother Saul mentioned just now about Mother Harlow. But um, one should keep in mind that she has daughters. It's not only Catholicism we are dealing with here, we are also including the false wines of Babylon that are also um, perpetrated by the children, by the daughters. Yeah. And um, I, I false think that doctrines. Pure false doctrines. Coming pure, from pure false doctrines. Yeah, pure false ones, yeah. You know what I mean very well. Clear false doctrines. If you get it clear, then. <laughs> The false doctrines that come out from Rome, which, uh, which of course is, um, has been inculcated into her daughters. Yeah. So that all of that constitutes Babylon in actual fact, this last going down. Because we tend to think that Babylon just refers in many instances only to Catholicism. But all those who are of that persuasion as well will constitute Babylon. Yeah. 
Okay, All I just right. wanted to make that for other persons on understand as well. Okay, what is that? Just one, one quick point again. Um, I, I heard all what you said, and like I said, I will go over and study it again. Marine, yes. Um, you introduced us to the term prolapsus. Prolapsus, yes. Prolapsus. And I'm asking myself, is there a prolapsus in the not being defiled by women? And yeah. what comes to mind is David. Yeah. Now, David has the spirit of God. He was counted as one of God's own. And we know from the script there that David is saved. Yeah. And David told Nathan on a particular occasion that I will build a temple unto the Lord. Now, Nathan told him, do whatsoever your hearts desire because I know that the Spirit of God is with you. And then later, God brought a vision to David and said, so although he was saved and in God's good graces, Go and he would have been presented as a chaste virgin. God said, David, you shall not build my temple because there's too much blood on your hand. Mm -hmm. And the blood was as a result of before what he did. Yeah. So is it a prolapsus with the not defiled by woman that God is considering? Yes, we are saved, we are virgin, but does he want this particular attribute in building this new temple? Okay, I, um, I would have to search. I'm not, I'm not sure or aware of, of any prolapses um, in relation to that. But you did mention something about being a chaste virgin. You know that Paul, in writing his letters to the churches, which included many Gentiles, said, I want to present you to God as what? a chaste virgin, and these are people who, were, who used to be defiled with idolatry. Corruption, corruption, and yet he said, I want, you to, I want to present you to Christ as a chaste virgin, which means that we, especially those of us who came in from the world and had been polluted and corrupted, can be presented to Christ as chaste virgins. So when we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, all our filthiness is washed away, and we are chaste virgins. Very good point. Yeah. Brother Blackman. Is it possible to have a pure, pure, pure faith and still be excluded from the 144,000? To have a pure faith yeah. and still be excluded from the 144,000? Yes, sir. Pardon? Yes, sir. Uh, explain what, what you're trying to get at. <laughs> uh, there's a law. I forgot it. No, it's... It, it, uh, one, the youth instructor or something like that. But is it possible that you have a pure faith, but because of hereditary traits, bad eating habits, which the body and mind is not up to a certain standard, and therefore not, you are eliminated, not by God eliminating you, but in fact, your past life and your choices, although you now have a pure faith, eliminates you from being there for 4,000. Well, um, depends on if you see a pure faith as only the doctrinal beliefs or the pure faith as a faith that has totally transformed you and made you what God wants you to be. Yeah, but you can be transformed but not recover from the early disabilities or whatever else and so on. Totally transformed but not recovered? Yeah, because God says he does not interrupt the actions of sin, but he, he makes you into a new creature that it saves you while not interrupting the actions of sin. Um, but he can, uh, in terms of, especially those who be committed, I believe he can reverse. You, you, you were there with Brother Saul's sermon about boutons, boutons that actually change the activity of the brain cells and, and, and lead in a different direction. I, I, I'm thinking that although, um, although we, we suffer the consequences of our actions, yet I believe, I'm thinking that God will still be able to transform us. Well, we, can, we can deal with that another time. Who else? Sister Carissa? Oh, okay, good. No, um, just a minute here. Examining the evidence, the 144,000 are described as first fruits. What is the role of first fruits?
to signal the readiness of the harvest or to re reap or to reap the remainder of the harvest. So if we understand the role of the 144,000 as first fruits, I think we will better understand this matter. The, when, the for, when the crop was ready, the priest would take um, a bunch of the grain and wave them as first fruits, signaling that the harvest was ready. Now that grain did not go and reap the rest of the grain. That, rain, that grain signifies that the harvest was ready. So the, the first fruits, the 144,000 who would have perfected character and who, who would have endured the crisis and showed that God can produce a people who will obey him under all circumstances, including the greatest pressure. These are the 144,000 who have been produced. They, they, um, Kamal mentioned something that after they have gotten the victory of the beast, they go through then what is called the, um, during the final, during the great time of trouble, they go through what is called the time of Jacob's trouble, which is to purify them from all earthliness. So that, that 144,000 now becomes absolutely pure, and they signify to the rest of the universe, the harvest is ready. You know, Brother Saul says that the 144,000 are the first fruits that signifies that the harvest is ready. The great multitude is the harvest of the ages that will be resurrected. Now, that's what he says. Other people say other things. But what we are saying for sure is that there is no ev the evidence we've seen does not indicate that the 144,000 preach and bring in the great multitude but that the, what we are seeing here, the 144,000, because of the level of absolute perfection and maturity that they achieve, signal to the rest of the universe, the harvest can now be reaped. And the reaping of that harvest is not preaching a message to bring in our great multitude, but Jesus and the angels coming to gather the people, his people. Any further comments or questions? We are now open for any other comments or questions. Or we can deal with other comments and other issues tomorrow as time permits. But, uh, Elder Newton, there is a scripture that says that war unto them that give trial and suck in those days. Now, I'm wondering, is it possible for somebody who is going through the end time crisis to be able to do that, to be able simply to survive along with their small child and that small child be translated as well. All right. Um, <laughs> now, It seems to me that God will bring his people to a point in time when he will, he will show them what to do. Um, I've already met some people say they're, no long, they're, not going to, they're married, but they're not going to have children because they don't want to bring children into this world. Um, I suspect there will be more and more such people as, as time goes on. But the, the point is this. I cannot explain everything that will happen. What I can say is everybody will receive the message everybody will be brought to a point of decision. Um, we have a doctrine where if children are under a certain age, the parents make the decisions for those children. So everybody will be covered. All right, well, no more comments or questions at this time. You've enjoyed a long, a long session, but as I said, um, I'm hoping then that you can have time for the, for the other questions later, but because of some questions that were coming through to me during camp, especially from the overseas brethren, I wanted, before they went back, to be able to deal with that, mess, that matter so that they will be in a better position to understand it. Um, the questions about risk and so on, I believe we can, we can tackle them later. So I thank you for your patience. You have the handouts with those questions. You have the handouts with the um, quotations that I believe will, will help you significantly. Uh, Brother Mitchell, you catching a pain early in the morning. You, 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 have, you can't go without, without saying something. 
it, it might, it, you have to use the mic. Brother Mitchell is leaving early in the morning, so, so he can't leave without saying something. All right. That, what time are you leaving? Will you be in Britain? No, my, what, flight, my flight is already 12 o'clock. Your flight is? At 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock? Yeah. I, so I, you leave in camp about? Yeah, 10 o'clock. 10. All right. So you're leaving early in the morning. Yeah. So I just rechecked my... Oh, you just rechecked the schedule. Yeah. And the, it's not 9 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, what I can say, but when Just I, come close to the mic. Uh, yes, okay. Yes. All right. Praise the Lord. Bring it up a bit. Yeah. Amen. All right. All I can say, brethren, I'm happy to be here. Um, I've been coming to camp for, for the past, I can't remember how, it could be about 10 years. Many now, years. Right? Many years. Yeah. And um, this year has been an exciting one. I, I am happy to, to see that the brethren of Twin City has made a difference. And I say, brethren, um, I want to thank God for sending them here too. Because yeah. they add to the Trinidad crowd. Yeah. And making the, the, the camp here a little more exciting. Yeah. Right? They were supportive in many ways, and I want to thank God for them. And also, uh, we extend from Gaspolo Ministry. Yeah. I want to thank God for being, um, I and Sister Martin can be here also. Yeah. So we, all the work that has been done in this camp, yeah. from Elder Dugan, you, Ms. Elder Newton, and Austin, and all the others, we have been praying for you all yeah. that this camp would have been successful, and it is. So may we continue to press on, and looking forward to the new year when the camp will be, all will look better. Yeah. So every year we look forward for a better camp. Yes. So may God bless the better how, 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 how is um, Sister Mitchell doing? She was at camp um, a couple of years back. Yes. Well, I hope that may, maybe I hope that next year she can be here, God's willing. Yeah. But they are on the, on the YouTube, YouTube and they have been following. Day They've by been following day. by yes. the, on, the, the, on YouTube. From, yes. Yeah. So day by day, so no, nothing is lost. Nothing is so lost. So they yeah. are uh, with us here. Yeah. And may God bless us all and that I see you all again yeah. next year. No, Brother Mitchell, when we, um, when we have a, we've had one or two little services in, in our room, and I noticed that Brother Mitchell sings quite well in those services. Uh, you singing tonight? <laughs> uh, well, when that time comes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. Yeah. All right. Yes. All okay. Right. God bless you all. Yeah. Okay. Who else is leaving? Um, Sister Bell for leaving. Sister Debbie said, well, take a minute or take a minute and say something. Sister Bell for you leaving too? Where's Sister Bell for? Sister Bell for. <laughs> right, Sister Debbie said used to come to camp years ago. Um and then, well, we haven't seen her for a while. But when I, when I went to Trinidad, when my seven brother Saul went to Trinidad earlier this year for the camp at Comana with um, Bishop McKnight and, and the um, Train City group, Dust Left the Words Ministries, we got this call um, saying Sister Debbie set. This is Sister Debbie set. And she planning to come to camp. She want the dates because she bringing people. So she's here. Amen. Good evening, beloved. Wait, you have a new name. Oh, oh, sorry, this is Sister Lucille. This is oh, Sister sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, sorry, this is Sister Lucille that we met at Comana um, in yes. February. Yes. Uh, beloved, good afternoon. Yeah. I must say that, as I said to someone earlier, it is a bittersweet for me. And I can understand how, Paul, how John felt as he laid at the bosom of Christ. This is the feeling that I got from here. So it's bitter for me to leave all this love that has been being poured out on us, all the information that we've been getting, the increased light, the increased knowledge. I want to thank God for that and that he will continue to bless you all in this way so that many, like myself, can come and feast sumptuously. It's going to be sweet for me to be reunited with my children. So I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to do his good work in here with you all and with the congregation, and that this work will continue to go out and draw in God's people. For as he said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And I thank God for everything that I've been afforded here. It has been a wonderful privilege. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for being here with us as well. You're leaving when? 
tomorrow morning, 6.45. Well, have a good, a good night's rest. You, you still have time to um, sing a song for us tonight and then get a good rest. If you want to do a duet with Brother Mitchell, you have my permission. Anybody else leaving early tomorrow? I know there are others um, leaving tomorrow night. So Brother Zaki and others leaving tomorrow night. Quite a few. Sister Martin, you leaving tomorrow, tomorrow morning too? Where is she? All right. Okay, well, um, I think we can close then. Um, yeah. Thank you for your, thank you for your, um, your patience. I hope you have your item ready for tonight, singing and so on, and we'll continue to enjoy the camp. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your goodness and love. We thank you for your salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your mercy and grace, your compassion and kindness. Thank you for the time we've spent so far and the discussion we've had on the 144,000. We pray that the matters will grow clearer as we go on so that we understand the things that pertain to our salvation and for our survival and our work in the end of time. Continue to bless us this evening. Continue to protect and keep us. Let, not, let us not drop our guard or become slack or complacent we know that on a night like tonight people can assume well everything is done and people can do as they like we pray that you will place a spirit on restraint on those who would be wild and unruly in discipline and own way so that the camp will not be we will not run into various problems that we can run into through indiscipline, irreverence, awareness, and, ev and strictly speaking, evil. So be with us the rest of the evening. Guide and direct in everything. Let rest your protective hand upon us, your restraining hand, so that we shall continue to dwell in peace and safety and not be marred by anything wrong, in Jesus' name, amen. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, amen.